Father, we now come to your holy word and we pray that your Holy Spirit would take hold of it and apply it to our hearts. Speak through your word, we pray. Make these moments very precious to us. But above everything else, we want to see the Lord Jesus. For we ask in his name. Amen. Well, again, let me just say a very hearty thanks for your welcome. You've been very patient with me. I don't know how you put up with me, really. But uh, you've been very welcoming, and I do appreciate that. It's a real privilege to be here. Um, the next mission, for those of you who pray, begins a week tomorrow in, um, um, in Derbyshire, in Stenson Fields, Derbyshire. Uh, I, think it's the, I think it's the seventh one-week mission I've done with them. It may be the eighth. And uh, they, a bit like yourself, have seen considerable growth. They began about 15 years ago as a tiny little nucleus of Christians, and they now have grown to a similar sort of size congregation, maybe slightly larger, I don't know. And, but basically, the people who've come have been converted through the work that they're doing. It's very, very encouraging. So it's great to be there again. It doesn't mean that I'm twiddling my thumbs for this week, but I haven't got a one-week mission this week. It's individual events here and there, which too many to go into. I, one of the themes of this week, uh, I've tried to point out, and I think many of you have come and agreed with what I've been saying, that the whole tone, the tenor of society and the media especially, but the educational system at the moment is very, very anti-Christian. We're bombarded with cynical, sceptical views about Christianity, and of course a, a new generation just takes these on board. And I think if you ask many people just out in the street, what is it that Christians are passionate about, they would say things like, I don't know, whether we should have women bishops, or what, what, what do we think about homosexuality and this sort of thing. But it's interesting, the passage that Phil has just read to us at the end of Luke's Gospel is Jesus giving to his early followers what we call the Great Commission. Now it's interesting, we, we read the same Great Commission in Matthew's Gospel, but the emphasis that Matthew takes up is that we're to go and make disciples of all nations. We, say, we see the Great Commission in Mark's Gospel, and the emphasis of Mark is go and preach to every creature, every individual. We get the same Great Commission in John's Gospel, and the emphasis there is on the fact that he's with us. Peace, I leave with you. But Luke, in giving us the Great Commission as Jesus spoke it, focuses on what it is that we as Christians are to go into all the world and proclaim what are the core, the foundational, the fundamental truths of Christianity? What are the basics that we're all about? And you'll be interested to know that issues such as women bishops, etc., are not there. There are four core truths. Jesus said, go and tell your neighbours. Well, he says, go to Jerusalem first of all, but that's where they were. Go and tell your neighbours and then all nations these core truths. Significantly as well... He says, these are the things that were written in the Law of Moses and the Prophets and the Psalms. Now, as you know, our Bible is divided into two main sections. We have the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament, that part that was written before Jesus came, and the New Testament, the part that was written after his coming. The Old Testament, we divide into 39 books. The 39 books of the Old Testament. In Jesus' day, they divided those same 39 books. It's exactly the same Old Testament, but they divided them into three sections. The law, the Psalms, and the prophets. And Jesus said, these three sections, we would use the word the Old Testament, but they didn't use that phrase then. These three sections, this book, this Old Testament, they speak of exactly these same Four truths that I want you to go and tell all nations. The Bible is one whole, it's one complete volume. Yes, 66 books in all, in the Old and the New Testament, but they all have these common themes, and these are the ones that Jesus wants us to go and make known. So what is it a Christian believes? Now, if you're a Christian here this morning, this is what you're to go and share with your neighbours and with the nations. And if you're here, not yet a Christian, but you're wondering about Christian things, trying to weigh it all up, what's it all about? What are the, what are the important things? What, what makes them so passionate about these truths? These are the four basic truths that we're all about. First, he says, go and tell your neighbours and the nations that I had to suffer. Now, think about this. This is Jesus reflecting on his own death seven weeks after he died. No, nobody else can ever do that. 
But Jesus has lived, he's died, he's been buried, he's risen, and now he's speaking about his own death just days after suffering on the cross. And he says, go and tell about my sufferings. Now, again, stop and think about this for a moment. What was so unique about Jesus' sufferings? Because if you've ever seen Spartacus, you'll know loads of people were crucified. And they were. It was a very commonplace means of capital punishment. But Jesus said, go and tell them about my sufferings. Josephus was the great Jewish historian. He was born round about the time when Jesus was crucified. But he chronicled the history of the nation of Israel. And he described the things that happened around about the, the time when Jesus was ministering. And he's, he talks about his death and his resurrection. And then he tells us things that happened subsequently. In AD 70, the Romans invaded Israel. They raised Jerusalem to the ground. And he describes the horrors of all that happened. But there's a very terrible scene where he describes all along the Mediterranean coast, hundreds of little Jewish fishing boats each with their masts, and crucified on either side of the mast were two Jewish victims. So crucifixion was a very normal, common thing. So why is Jesus saying, go and tell your neighbours and your nations uh, and the nations about my sufferings? And the answer is, when Jesus suffered on the cross, it wasn't him suffering as a martyr or as a good example it wasn't him suffering just physically. He was taking on himself the sin of the world. Now, sometimes sin to us is abhorrent. We read, say, of those people who recently were beheaded in Libya, the Egyptian Coptic Christians, and, and it sends a shiver down our spine. We think this, this is horrendous. But with Jesus, who's totally holy and pure, and spotless, all sin, even the most respectable sins, even the sins legalized by Parliament, are abhorrent to him. And yet when he was on the cross, he carried on himself our sin. So terrible was this that even the Father God turned away from his darling son. He was cut off from his father. Jesus said, Go and tell your neighbours and the nations about my sufferings, how I took on myself sin. I paid the penalty. It would take them all eternity to pay so that they might be forgiven. He died for you and me. He paid for our sin, your sin, my sin, laid on Jesus. Now, even the idea of sin these days is something that we don't find particularly easy. We talk about egocentricity. We talk about weakness, you know, this week we've had talk of people's demons and this sort of, we, we love to brush the concept under the carpet. I remember, oh, I don't know, maybe two, three years ago now on, um, on Question Time on Thursday night on BBC, David Dimbleby chairing his panel. Have you noticed he always has atheists? Well, on this occasion, there were only two of them, so it wasn't too bad. And uh, there was Chris Bryant, Labour Member of Parliament for Merthyr Tydfil, the one MP probably who is the most militantly anti-Bible Christianity, and David Starkey, historian. During the course of the questions, I've forgotten exactly what question it was, but Chris Bryant said this. He said, there is no such thing as evil. No such thing as evil? And at that moment, David Starkey, fellow atheist, turned and said to him, when those men flew those planes into the Twin Towers... That was evil. Now, the crowd applauded. But actually, Jesus goes much further than that. He was once talking to his followers, and he said to them, to us, if you want, he said, if you then being evil. So does God regard us as evil? And I think if we could recognize how abhorrent our sin is compared with the holiness of God, we would say, yes, I too am evil. But Jesus suffered and died so that we could be forgiven. Go and tell your neighbors, he says, and the nations about my sufferings. And then he said, go and tell them as well that these books the Psalms, the prophets, the law. These books not only talk about my death, but my resurrection. 
And it's interesting they do. You know, you say, what about the law? Well, there are detailed descriptions about sacrifices that would be made and innocent animals dying, but some being set free, picturing death and resurrection. The Psalms talk about how Jesus would suffer and die. Even the very words that would be spoken around his cross were written in the Psalms a thousand years before Jesus was born. And the Psalms teach as well that the Holy One would not suffer corruption. Jesus didn't decay in the grave. He was dead. But three days later, he rose from the dead. The prophets, full of the notion that a Savior is going to come, who's going to die and take away our sin. But the resurrection, do you find it difficult to believe? Do you think it's some sort of just a notion that has been added, you know, Elvis lives, so Jesus lives, that that sort of idea? No. There is huge historical evidence recorded by Christians in the Bible and out of the Bible, by Jewish historians such as Josephus and Roman historians such as Tacitus, who talk about Jesus dying and rising from the dead. The world has never produced a greater victory than Jesus conquering the grave, conquering death. The one who lived and died raised himself back to life. You say, just a moment, Roger, that's an odd phrase to use. Do you know, the Bible teaches there is one God, and that one God is in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in every great work of God throughout the Bible, the three persons of the Godhead are at work. So we read that God the Father created the world. God the Spirit created the world. God the Son created the world. When Jesus was born, God the Father sent Jesus the Son and the Holy Spirit worked in the virgin womb of Mary so that she conceived and later was to give birth to the baby Jesus. Think of the baptism. The Son went down into the water. The Father spoke from heaven, this is my beloved Son, hear him. And the Holy Spirit descended as a dove. Now, with the resurrection, we read that God the Father raised Jesus back to life. We read that God the Spirit raised Jesus back to life. But Jesus said he would raise himself back to life. John chapter 2, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it. And he spoke of the temple of his body. John chapter 10, no one can take my life from me. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. Somehow, in a way, I can't get my mind around, the dead Jesus raised himself back to life. He who is the life gave life to his dead body. I have a friend called Andy Todd. He's he's a character. He's he's quite reserved, but what what a man. He is an illusionist, and he does the most amazing things. He regularly saws his wife in half. But it can't be difficult. She's a doctor, and she goes to work the next day, so it's obviously very straightforward to be a doctor these days. Uh, He puts a a, a sword through her head, and she survives. He does amazing things. I'm seated where you're looking in. It is illusion. Don't worry. It's not. Yes, okay. And, um, yeah, (laughs) I know what you're thinking. I'm glad I'm not married to him, right? (laughs) And um, um, I'm seated about where you are, and he was there with a table covered with a cloth, And he took hold of the tassel of the tablecloth like this. And you could see there was nothing up his hand, and he just got hold of the tassel. And suddenly, the whole table and tablecloth started to float. And I was was there, I was trying to look, there must be some strings, but there were no strings. There must be a pole, but there was no pole. How is he doing this? And then he said to us, you all think this table and this tablecloth are floating, don't you? They are not, he said. This is an illusion. And I was looking and thinking, well, I wish you'd tell us how you do it, but it's so frustrating. He won't. But just an illusion. But he does this presentation for about an hour of illusions. And then he goes on to demonstrate very, very powerfully how the resurrection of Jesus Christ cannot have been an illusion, how it had to be reality. Look it up, www.illusion, and then the number two, reality.com. So fascinating. Jesus really did live and die and rise. About three weeks ago, I went to the village of Bladen. I'd wanted to go there for a long time, but I was passing by in Oxfordshire near Blenheim Palace, and I stood by the grave of Sir Winston Churchill. And uh, I thought, you know, this is the person we once voted the greatest ever Brit. I mean, probably that's correct. But he didn't have the power to raise himself. 
Only Jesus defeated death, conquered the grave, and rose from the dead. And he had a body that was going to be as much at home on earth as it would be in heaven. Did you notice when Phil was reading, uh, Jesus said, touch me, does a ghost have flesh and bones as you see I have? He didn't say flesh and blood, because his blood had been shed on the cross, and he wasn't going to regather it. But he had a resurrection body. You could touch, you could feel, he could eat, and yet it could go through walls. A resurrection body. Go and tell your neighbors and the nations that I had to suffer and rise from the dead. Then thirdly, he said, <clears throat> go and tell them about repentance and forgiveness of sins. God's agenda to change the world is to go and tell the nations about Jesus' death, his resurrection, the need to repent, and the need to receive forgiveness of sins. Repentance and forgiveness of sins. The most important message we can pass, to, pass on to anybody are these great needs. Our part, to put it simply, is we should repent. That means to turn from our sin and look to God. God's part, to put it simply, is that he forgives us. Repentance is this voluntary change of mind that turns the sinner from his or her way towards God. Do you remember when John the Baptist began preaching? He was a little bit older than Jesus, a cousin of Jesus. What was his message? He said, repent. He, he was very specific and very bold. He turned to the tax collectors and said, you need to repent. He turned to the soldiers. You need to repent and do the right things. Very specific, but repent. Jesus began his ministry by saying, repent. Peter, on that first great Christian sermon preached at Pentecost, he said to the crowds who said, what must we do? He said, repent. Paul, every single sermon that Paul preached all the way through the book of Acts has in it the need to repent, every one of them. And we've only got the pracy, the shortened sort of sermon notes, but they all say repent. Repentance is not just remorse. It's not eating humble pie. It's acknowledging that we've been born with our faces against God and we need to turn with our faces to God. Let me tell you a story. If my wife was seated here at this moment, she would just quietly shake her head and say, Roger, don't tell them it. But I'm going to tell you it. She thinks, don't tell them it, because nobody will believe it. Well, I'm not particularly interested in whether you believe it or not. It's the point of it that I'm keen to get across. I read it, and in your good faith, I'm happy to believe it. But it <coughs> comes from the First World War, and it concerns one woman who was married to her husband, and they had one son. But she lost both her husband and her son in the First World War. She felt immensely the pain and the heaviness of heart over this. And what made it a little bit worse for her was that next door was a woman who had a husband and five sons, and all of them survived the war. She wanted to rejoice, but she felt her own grief. One night, she had a dream. And in the dream, an angel appeared to her. And the angel said to her, you may have your son back. Just for 10 minutes, but you can have him back. And you can choose which 10 minutes you'd like him back for. Maybe, maybe when he was a little baby and you nursed him. Maybe when he was a little toddler and he was playing out in the garden and came back so dirty but so happy. Maybe the day you saw him go to school, wearing, uh, carrying his satchel and so pleased to be going to school. Maybe the day you saw him graduate from school. Maybe the last time you ever saw him, when you saw him march so proudly off to war. You can have him back for 10 minutes and you can choose. And in the dream, she thought, and she said, I would like him back, please. But not for any of those moments that you've just described. I would like him back when he was a little boy. And I said to him, no. And he stamped his feet and he clenched his fists and he stomped off and he said, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. And then... A few minutes later, he came back with tears just rolling down his cheeks and he looked up so pitifully to me and said, oh, mummy, I'm sorry, I don't hate you at all. I love you, I love you, I love you. I'll never be naughty again. I'm so sorry. And she said in the dream, I never loved him more than when he came back and said, I'm sorry. Now, I don't think we can say about God that he never loved us more than, but he does love us. 
We have sinned against him, all of us. It's cut us off from God. It would keep us out of heaven. Sin would condemn us to hell. But God loves us. And he wants us to repent, to turn from our sin and receive forgiveness of sin. Because Jesus has died and risen, there is forgiveness. So the Bible has these wonderful promises. I mentioned them earlier on in the week. Things like God will blot out all our transgressions. He'll wash away our sin. He'll cleanse us. He'll cast our sins behind his back. He'll cast them into the deepest ocean. He'll separate them from us as far as the east is from the west. Forgiveness of sin. Your sins and your iniquities I will remember no more. He says, what wonderful promises. And it's all because Jesus has died. Go and tell your neighbours. Go and tell the nations about the sufferings of Jesus, the resurrection, repentance and forgiveness of sin. In the Bible, salvation is always equated with forgiveness of sin. And there is no other way to obtain forgiveness. You can't work for it, you can't earn it, you can't buy it. After death, of course, repentance and forgiveness are too late. Jesus said, go and tell everyone this message. One last thing I just want to add, and it's from verse 49. Time and again, people have said to me, well, Roger, I, I, I can see what you're saying. Do you know there's a lot in me that would love to become a Christian, but I don't know that I could keep up the Christian life. Do you ever feel like that? You know, I could ask Jesus to forgive me, but I don't know that I could follow him. I'd mess up, I'd do wrong. And actually, we do. But it's lovely because I think verse 49 the Lord Jesus deals with this as he speaks to the disciples before he goes and ascends back to his father. Listen to these words. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. Notice the three persons of the one God are there. The father's promise, I'm going to send you what my father's promised. The son's plans, I'm going to send you, but stay in the city. And the Holy Spirit's power until you've been clothed with power from on high. The triune God is with us. When you ask Jesus Christ to become your Lord and Savior, God, by his Spirit, comes to live within. And he gives us the ability, the strength, the desire and the power to start to live for him. He gives us the ability to keep going. Again, my wife, you'll think she's an ogre. She's not at all. But she mocks me for my enthusiasms. I become enthusiastic about something for a while and then fade. I, I became very enthusiastic once about Lapsang Souchong tea. Have you ever had Lapsang Souchong? It's gorgeous. It's, it's burnt, it's smelly, and it's delicious. Oh, and I've got lots of different types of Lapsang Souchong. And then somebody introduced me to um, Moroccan tea. Mm, yeah, that's nice. So then lots of different packets of Moroccan tea. And then I discovered, have you ever come across this licorice tea? Oh, it's gorgeous. It sends your blood sugar level, uh, sorry, your, your blood pressure level sky high, but it's worth it. What a great way to die, drinking <laughs> licorice tea. And uh, I was, uh, I don't know, have you ever been to Fortnum and Mason in London? It's, uh, it's the queen supplier of tea. You walk in and you feel rich. If you buy anything, pff, you're bankrupt. But anyway, but it's, it's one, I went into Fortnum and Mason once and I said to them, I said, excuse me, do you have any licorice tea, please? And they said, no, sir, we don't. I said, oh, right. Can I ask why? And they said, sir, because it's cheap. <laughs> Talk about being humiliated. I got some in Oxford, so it's okay. And, uh, but there we are, you know, my enthusiasm from this to that. Hey, becoming a Christian is not an enthusiasm. God forgives you, and he comes to live within you, and he makes you his. The triune God is with you through life, through death, because that will come, we don't know when, and then into eternity. None of us deserve heaven. We, we, if we could see our sin as it truly is, we'd say we deserve hell. But, but he promises us heaven, which is not a reward, it's a gift. So if you're a Christian, go and tell your neighbours and the nations these precious truths. But if you're not yet a Christian, and you think, what's it all about? That's what it's all about. The God who came into the world and suffered and died for us, the one who rose from the dead. And when we repent and we're commanded to, 
we receive forgiveness with God and reconciliation. And that reconciliation with God lasts not just for time, but for all eternity. And I'd like to close this morning by saying, look, if you're here and you've never truly trusted Jesus, what would, what would stop you even this morning just calling out in your heart and asking him to save you? What we do with Jesus matters for all eternity. The most important thing for Charles Kennedy this week was not whether he'd given great political speeches and amused us and made a very principled stand politically. But what mattered for him was, was he right with God? Because all eternity depends on that. And if you're not yet right with God, I would really urge you, ask Jesus to forgive you and come and live in your life. I'm going to pray a prayer. And it's a prayer similar to the one that I prayed when I became a Christian. If you've never truly trusted Jesus, would you pray this prayer with me? Not out loud, but in your heart and mind, asking the Lord Jesus to become your Lord and your Saviour. And if you do pray, well, Phil will say more. Do have a word with Phil or me at the end and just say, look, I prayed this morning that prayer. We've got a pack of booklets to help you to start to, to grow and become strong in your Christian faith. And if you have already trusted Jesus, go and tell your neighbours and, and the nations these precious truths. Let's pray. So I'm going to pray this prayer slowly and definitely. If you've never truly trusted Christ, I urge you to pray this prayer with me. Dear God, you know all that there is to know about me. So I want to confess my sin to you. With your help, I want to turn from it. I do believe Jesus died for me and rose from the dead. Please forgive me. Come and live within me. Become my Lord and Saviour and help me to follow you. For I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.